Okay. So you can see the frustration with Porgy and Bess. Thank you for staying. Hey, um, Kalina and uh, Howard, you want to come back up here for a few minutes? We won't stay very long. A couple more things about Porgy and Bess. Jeffrey Holder and Maya Angelou are uncredited extras in it. And, uh, and Irene Schraff, of course, you know, the great designer who also did the other film with, with Oliver. Um, I would love to hear some feedback and hear if you guys have any, any questions for us. And I know that it's late and we don't want to stay very long. So um, uh, Steve, this is Steve Olson, who's a wonderful designer that went to school with us. What year were you? Uh, I was 87, same year as Maine. 87, same year as Maine. And, uh, and Steve also worked on, with Tony Walton on the revival of right. Guys and Dolls. So when you think of Guys and Dolls going from Alziner to Oliver to Tony, it's unbelievable. <laughs> well, his was sort of a valentine to, to Milziner, to the, yeah, the, absolutely. the original and to that, that way of doing musicals with lots of drops, lots of painted scenery. Um, but I had a question about the, the Times Square look, the sort of backdrop yeah. um, in, in oh, the movie. Sorry, no. It only really looked great at the end. Yeah. Well, there's the opening se sequence too. Yeah. Because it, it looks like it, it wasn't. It looks unfinished, right? It looks unfinished. Yeah. I mean, until the end when it be, was looks like it was translucent, like when it was lit from behind. I don't know. It looks like it, maybe there, there was a critic that said, "This isn't neither real nor nor not real," and Oliver said, "That's exactly what I was going for." So, and I find that, I find it's an astonishing. Look, that that it's so unfinished, and yet there's real cars in front of it, right. and I don't know what stage it was shot on, or if it was outside. I'm pretty sure it was on a stage, although the lighting's pretty even. You know, it's it's it's. Uh... Does anybody else know more about those scenes, how they were shot? But yeah, I think. It looked like it was lit beautifully at the end, but not not you know not, not, not during the bulk of the show. Well, it you know, so, it was beautiful at the end. It was, it was great. It was depth. It had depth. But during the show, it was flat. I agree. You guys want to comment on that at all? Howard? <laughs> There's a mic right there. Well, I'm, the only thing I took from it was that he did it. It was clear that he he wanted real cars and something abstract at the same time. And so it seemed to me like he was making a definitely choice. I actually thought the opening drop and the closing drop was a whole separate drop that it was and that the other one was black and white and totally abstract it was just True. it was just signed and they were purposely super flat True. so then i kept going he was like i liked when the you know you looked at the street and it had puddles you know so they obviously right. didn't just paint the stage floor i mean he went to some care to make that kind of detail you know and but at the same time right behind it there's a black and white very, you know, and not even the signs were even meant to be real. They were very, there were pieces of signs kind of placed. So I was, I had no idea why he did that, but he, it seemed and like. And the sewer was so definitely sculptural. Seemed un, yeah, you know. and the sewer was like, <laughs> like totally three Which is an ode to the Melziner as well, or basically a ripoff, because that's exactly the scene. But you know, it was also the same choreography. Um, so I think that that was part of being true to how to do the scene in several ways. Certainly the mission. What, what's that, the original choreography? Uh, the craft my notes. For yeah. the craft game? I, I have to say that the Broadway, the arrival of Taylor Lane, uh, and uh, was very much like that. Yeah. Uh, in, in the missions, uh, in the boat, um, yeah. the sewer scene, very, very much the same. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's, it's, it's interesting where the choreography in all these films and in Oklahoma as well plays such a huge role. And Oklahoma, I think, is the most realistic looking film all the way through until you get to the, the until dream. Until the dream, about, yeah. But all we, four of these films, and Porgy is also of its own kind of, like it really feels like grand opera, like Oliver was going for this grand opera kind of scenery which you, which you would see at the Met or something. He only, he only did two designs for the Metropolitan Opera. One was La Traviata, the giant staircase and a giant chandelier. And he did uh, a disaster of an opera called Martha that has never been revived and has almost hit, never had any performances. But uh, he loved opera, and he did a lot of opera in Boston. But you know, he so did. yeah, with Sarah Caldwell. Oh, oh, okay. In fact, um, uh, Tom Munn tells a story that Maggie knows that uh, he, they'd come up to paint uh, a, 
and Oliver was dressed head to toe in a full white suit, and it was summertime. And and it was uh, yeah, it was painted on the ground. And uh, and the story that Tom told me is that Oliver wasn't happy with the way they were spattering these drops, and he took the brush, and he spattered you know to show them how to do it, and did not get a drop of paint on himself. <laughs> so I think that's a legend. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom swears by this story. But I also think that Oliver just never really embraced reality. I mean, I think if he struggled with movies, period, it's because they were so supposed to be so real. And I think he was such a beautiful, abstract sensibility in his designs. And I could imagine that he, I would imagine all the choices were very much on purpose. Um, it, I mean, we look at them now because we make movies and we really want to make everything more and more real where I think at the time people just literally had more license and embraced more theatrical language in movies. Well, like when you see Hello, Dolly, we were talking about this earlier, and it's so much notative stuff, and there's not enough room for everything, you know? So you have to find this balance between what's sculptural and what's painted, and I think primarily he was a painter first. Absolutely, which is why he was so big in ballet. Yeah. You know, and, and he also really loved, he loved to do sets with like where it's also just one drop and all the perspective is on that drop. He really loved to play with like the perspective and, and, uh, and, and a lot of it is actually in the clips that you showed. You can see how he, it was just really one drop and all these different shapes were painted and you were, your mind was projecting perspective and depth to it, but it really was just one plane. I remember when he, we were working on a, a, a ballet in class and he told me, he said, because I had some set that was too much, and he said, John, this area here, and he was basically talking about the first eight feet from the floor up, this is for the dancers. And then he said, and then from eight feet up, eight to 20 feet, that's for us. <laughs> so he really was conscious about what you saw as the big picture, and I think that's really clear in these things. I'd love to open it up for some more questions or thoughts. Oh, one thing I was just going to say, and just watching yeah, yeah. the, uh, unlike some other musicals, or other, at the at the same time, it's funny. There are a lot of low camera angles, you know, and it was consistent, and mm -hmm. it didn't matter. The same what happened on, because uh, I just decided to rent Ben Wagon last night. You can get it on YouTube for two nine, uh, two dollars ninety nine cents, and I forgot how I forgot about it and it was just shocked about how crazy that and wonderful it was and how, how much variation there was but I even then I was watching god there's so many low angles you know I work with a director who would she, I, I picked total locations based only on their ceiling you know <laughs> because I said oh, they won't you won't see the walls you're just gonna he's gonna shoot the ceiling because it's graphic and he does it so I'm very uh, and I uh, also worked with Danny DeVito, who also shoots you know, from his point of view, which is very low. <laughs> and so, uh, so I become very attuned to that. So I, I was shocked about because that's what I kept seeing in the, in the footage. There was a question way in the back. You might want to check with uh, LACMA sometime. They showed that 1959 version a couple of years ago, an evening showing. And it was a gorgeous print. Yeah, so, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah it was, I don't know where Europe. they got it from. I think they did get it from abroad, but yeah. it, was, it was perfect. The colors, everything was very accurate. But nothing like this, right? No. Yeah, I mean, this is. I think it was the exact same thing, that you could just see the colors. Yeah, and the it other seems thing... like the scenes and everything are coming back to me as being what was in that film. The other thing about Oklahoma that is fascinating to me is that it took twice as long to shoot because they were struggling with formats from CinemaScope and Todd AO. And CinemaScope, the edges would blur because of the lens. And Todd AO was incredibly crisp, but it had to have a curved screen in the theater. So they actually shot every scene in Oklahoma twice. Both, way. oh, both okay. ways. And if you compare them, the opening sequence, completely mm. different in the Todd AO version from the, the uh, CinemaScope version, and there's a lot of less widescreen things in the Todd AO version that, that are in the CinemaScope version. So it's a little schizophrenic. I'd love to see somebody do a side-by-side -side comparison because it's shocking. And the performances are kind of better in one scene and then the other, just the little ones I was able to sample. So, and you can get them both in the Oklahoma DVD, I believe, They're both, they have both formats. Um, certainly, um, and the Bandwagon DVD, because it's Warner Brothers, has a lot of really great 
outtakes and extras and things like that. So I really recommend Bandwagon. And hopefully someone will realize the worth of Porgy and Bess. Unfortunately, there's so much wrong with the whole, from the very beginning, that I don't know if it'll ever be righted. Um, other questions? I'm, yes. Uh, I'm Tom Mellick. Oh, hi, Tom. Tom Mellick. 75. 75, right. So you knew Oliver well. I'm old enough to remember Times Square at that point, because when we were kids, we would go down there. And if you look carefully at this film, those people, the characters, they act exactly like real people in Times Square acted. And I think that Oliver was reflecting what, uh, what those characters were doing. Because that, that is the way that they acted. I mean, the, the dressing was more Broadway, but it, it was, uh, I think that he did that perfectly. Because uh, we're talking about the reality of film and, and the reality of stage. The one thing I, I wanted to mention, <laughs> I was working for Oliver, I was his assistant on a, a Broadway show. Can everyone hear Tom? I'll, I'll give you the mic. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I can't remember the name of it, but I was on stage, and uh, this is kind of an IA story. My job for Oliver, we, the, the curtain had to come down, and all the scenery had to change. So I had a crew of 12 IA guys. So I say this, I, I, I was coordinating them and saying, all right, you got, you're going to do this. You two are going to move that table. And I go to this one AIA guy, and, and here's the chair. And, he, and I said, well, okay, so you're going to pick up this chair, and you're going to take it off stage. He looks at me, and he says, by myself? <laughs> <laughs> so later on, I'm sorry, just an Oliver story. We, we, were, we were rehearsing, and... Uh, Here's this big stage, and it was the first time I ever saw a stagehand walk the pipes. Have you, have you seen that? Uh, they, they, they won't let you do that now because of OSHA. But, uh, so we, we raise the curtain, and we're going to do this big change, and there's this old man, and he's got a broom, a push broom, and he's sweeping up the sawdust that was on the stage and the dirt that was on the stage. That was Oliver. Wow. That's uh, amazing. Thank you, Tom, very much. Uh, any, uh, anyone else want to speak or ask a question? Um, I have one last story, which was a famous story about Oliver doing the opening of My Fair Lady in London. And he was doing a, a, the, uh, one of these two pictures, I think Guys and Dolls. No, it was. Uh, I think it was Oklahoma, and they were in that period where they had prepped and everything was built, but it was like a month before they were gonna start shooting. And he uh, decided to go to take one of the first transcontinental flights to London for the opening, because his friends that had worked on it in New York said they were gonna be there. So he went to Sam Gold, so Sam Goldwyn got wor word of this, and the night before he left, Oliver was summoned to Sam Goldwyn's house, which was like being you know, to the president's house or whatever. And uh, the story is, and Oliver told this a couple of times, so I think it's pretty close. Uh, Sam Golden came out in his night clothes, and his wife was there, and he was crying, and he says, please don't leave me, I need you here. And Oliver said, nothing is gonna happen for the next two weeks, I'm only gone for two weeks. We have a month till we start shooting. And, and uh, Golden says, no, please don't go, you're like a son to me. Which I think that there was quite a familial relationship like that between the two of them. And, uh, and he says, talk to my wife. And so he brought his wife out, and she tried to talk Oliver into staying. And Oliver said, no, no, I'm going. This is ridiculous. You guys are crazy. Um, there's nothing for me to do here. So he went and uh, went to London, got there, went to the opening. You know, a couple days, like for the preview, nobody came from New York because they had all assumed he couldn't get out of his 50-page contract, which he had, of course, never read. And uh, the only other Hollywood story that I've heard from two people, both from Ted Sinisi and from Campbell, and you might have known this, Tom, that Oliver often said that one of the things he liked best about LA was having a pool in his backyard. So, um, but I don't think it was a happy time for him here, but I, I think, think that he... he hated it. In fact, when I went to school there, uh, I, mean, I talked to him about going to Hollywood. John Malone was in uh, my class, okay. and uh, Oliver said, you guys want to go to Hollywood? 
and, and move salt shakers around for some stupid photographer? <laughs> yeah, he would call that rearranging the ashtrays. Right, yeah. So he says, you're not going to go rearrange ash ashtrays for the cinematographer, are you? Yeah, he said that in our class, too. So, I, I, but I think he had great respect for people that did want to do it, and he had great respect for it. But I think that also he said that in the theater, he was able to work very quickly. And, and he didn't like the fact that the studios owned you, you know, heart and soul, and kind of could tell you what to do and where to be. Well, he did, he did everything. And if, I don't know if you guys um, took the 829 exam, but in the, in the old days, when we took it, you had to design a, a play the setting, you had to design the costumes, specific costumes for the, set, for the show, and you had to do the lighting. You had to do the lighting for one thing, and they would give you a day, or well, a couple of hours really, with IA guys. Right. Who, and, and you would Hang have to do the lighting. So you, had to do, you had to do a lighting practical? Well, see, that was all I, I did the other parts, but, but not the. I had to do a lighting plot, but I didn't have to oh, actually do. Okay. Oh, an actual practical? You had a month, you had 30 days to do the yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And then you had, you had to actually, they gave you three stagehands. And they gave you an hour. But that, that was, was the all category. I, when I was doing it, the all category was gone. It was just set design. And I, um, I, I didn't pass the first two times. And, and the third time was the first year that they took people on their portfolio. And so I got in on the first, I was the first group of people. No, I did not. Well, actually, I didn't finish. <laughs> but that's a long story. So um, that's Bonnie Salzman, another classmate of ours, and at least of mine. Uh, any other Oliver stories you want to hear or talk about? Um, one last story I will tell you. Sam Goldwyn was upset that Oliver wouldn't get in until noon often. And he said, you know, I'm here in my office at 8 AM. And Oliver said, well, I don't get in until noon because I'm a genius. <laughs> And Sam Goldwyn had no comeback. <laughs> and he was never bothered by it again. He said it in a nice way. <laughs> he yes. did. He did. He was a gentleman. He yes. was a gentleman. Yes. Yeah, he was, he was the, the golden rule for sure. <laughs> well, I, I do have a couple people to thank, which is Debbie Patton from the Art Directors Guild. And, Yay. Thanks, and all of these slides and stuff that you saw was Mary, uh, Rosemary, Rosemary Knopf. I hope I pronounced your name right. And she's an incredible researcher in the Art Directors Guild. So thank you, Rosemary. And she, uh, if you need any research done, they ha the Art Directors Guild has a researcher now, and she's quite reasonable, so I hope you'll use her. And uh, any other last thoughts? Tom, thank you for coming. Stephen, thank you for being here, yeah, everyone. Thanks for inviting us. It's so great. happy. I don't know if I got it through the union or for you, but uh, it was uh, 8 to 5.30, so I got here at 5. <laughs> <laughs> well, so happy to have you here, especially for working with Oliver. And I only did, uh, Jeff Sage and I assisted him on two shows, and they were uh, one called Peccadillo, which lasted for one night on Broadway, and it was a murder mystery, and I have two chairs in my living room from that show. <laughs> and, and the other one was Night of the Iguana with Rebecca de Mornier oh, down wow. in Washington. Oh, yeah. That one. Yeah. And it was a, he did a gorgeous, you know, he had done the original, he'd done a gorgeous kind of reimagining because you could actually get stuff where he had done it, I don't know if he did the very original, I think that might have been Melziner, but he did one years ago and then he did this one. Oh, he might have done the original. And that's when I learned on that production that that rain is in the sound department on Broadway, so, and not in its own special effects department. But, um, I want to thank Kalina and Howard. And uh, Maine had to leave early. And thank you all so much for being here. This has been a real pleasure to go over this stuff. Thanks. <laughs>